In this episode, we discuss the application of artificial intelligence in continuous process industries. We talk about the use of natural language processing for industrial data management, the application of machine learning in process simulation, and the application of semantic web technologies to reduce industrial data silos, and we also talk about the challenges and future potential of AI in process industries, among many other topics. My guest on this episode is Simon Rogers. Simon is a digital transformation consultant at Yokogawa Electric Corporation in South Korea, where he helps South Korean companies move from industrial automation to industrial autonomy by applying the latest digital technologies, including cloud computing, IIoT, and artificial intelligence to maximize the use of and value from data. He was previously the Vice President of Digital Solutions at Yokogawa headquarters in Japan. He was also the Managing Director of Yokogawa in the United Kingdom, among many other previous roles in companies such as Honeywell, ABB, and KBC. Quick thank you to our sponsors. This episode is made possible by our friends at HiveMQ, who are providers of an enterprise-grade, edge- and cloud-based MQTT broker. And Opto22, manufacturers of reliable industrial controllers for automation and IIoT applications. So please do check them out to help support this podcast. Welcome to the fourth generation podcast here on industry 4 tv which is a series of weekly interviews designed to help you learn IIoT from some of the world's leading practitioners. So make sure to subscribe and click on the notification bell to make sure that you never miss any of the interviews. If you find this conversation interesting, please review it with five stars on Apple Podcasts, follow on Spotify, and also connect with me on LinkedIn at Kudzai Mandi Teresa. Now, here's my interview with Simon. Simon, thank you so much for joining us uh, on the Fourth Generation Podcast. I would like to welcome you to the show. Uh, thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Awesome. So today I want to talk to you about the application of AI in the continuous process industries. Now, to, to begin, Simon, uh, how important is artificial intelligence for continuous process industries? I, th I think it's extremely important for every industry and um, including the process industries. I think there are un unlimited use cases of artificial intelligence in the process industries. In the particular process industries which, which I specialize in, which is oil, gas, petrochemicals, the number one priority is process safety. So I think it's good to start there. Um, and there are some great opportunities to improve safety with, uh, with AI, um, uh, detecting anomalies, changes in the, uh, unexpected changes in the operation of the process. Uh, sometimes that could be related to equipment, which is one of the early applications of, of AI in the process industries, detecting faults before they occur, um, but also process problems. So before, again, before the operators might otherwise notice them, before the alarms start go, uh, going off, you can use machine learning to, with you know, pattern recognition, anomaly detection, to determine to, to, to identify when the process is moving outside of its normal operating window. So, you know, I would start with 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 safety. But, you know, I think another huge challenge for our industry is net zero emissions. And we've been working on one particular use case to use machine learning to reduce. Uh, energy and emissions in a crude distillation unit on a on an oil refinery in, in Europe. So there are certainly many opportunities to to help with that uh, huge challenge to reduce emissions and generally optimizing the the process. Uh, I already mentioned equipment and general reliability. Um, predictive maintenance has been one of the widespread use cases of uh, of artificial intelligence um, and. There are many, many more I could go on and on, but there, I think there's a huge, huge potential for um, AI, particularly machine learning, but also symbolic AI as well. Um, you know, we've been working in the industry to, to use expert systems in the past. You know, maybe it's when I started my career, we were looking at that, um, but particularly the advances in machine learning recently, um, I think are extremely exciting for uh, the process industries. Okay. Awesome. So, well, according to my understanding, uh, 
AI is, is, is best applied to, to plants that uh, have undergone some, some form of transformation from your, your, your manual paper-based operations to, to digital operations. So what are the technologies that enable this kind of digital transformation in the process industry? Yeah, thanks. Um, it's good, good questions. I think that, that, you know, if we think about machine learning in particular, so if we talk about machine learning as a major subset of AI, which is being used at the moment, the, the, the key requirement is data. And the process industries have collected real-time process data in process historians in, in uh, real-time databases um, for, for many years, I mean, for decades. And many mature plants, they have that information for decades and stored. Uh, so there's a huge um, um, mine of information, if you like, with, which has huge value, which has been under uh, underutilized. One of the challenges with that data is the quality of the data. So I, I personally think that for many of the use cases, a combination of first principle models, process simulation, and um, a, a data centric approach, a machine learning approach is a good way to go because when you talk about process data, there are some fundamental laws of thermodynamics and heat material balances, which the data should um, comply with. And if you try to create models which fundamentally break those rules, then you, you're gonna get bad models. You're gonna have bad data in, and you, you're gonna get bad results out. So I, I think cleaning up that data is a, is a key requirement. Making the data accessible. So historically those databases are on at the plant level. So then they're, they're not in the cloud. And that can, you know, particularly in large organizations that can limit who can access the data and, and also, of course, the computing power that's available in the cloud and the availability of machine learning platforms and so on. It's much easier to deploy if you're if you're operating in, in the cloud. So I, I think those are, are, are key steps in terms of enabling digital transformation. It's also important to make sure that you build on a good foundation. In general, in automation, there are you know, levels of automation, starting with your basic instrumentation, right, which is measuring your sensors, which are measuring uh, pressure, temperature, flow, whatever. Um, if you've got bad measurement, then everything that you build on that measurement that uses that measurement is, is going to be bad. The same with your control system, with your basic control system, your distributed control system or SCADA system, whatever you're using. Um, you know, your basic controls, your regulatory controls, which are basically generally PID controllers, you know, they need to be um, reasonably tuned. And then your multivariable control, which sits on top of that. So each layer, it's important to get that right. So there's no point in trying to have these really fancy um, new digital technologies when your basic control is not, or your basic sensors are not functioning correctly. So it's, it's important to, to build everything on a solid foundation and make sure sometimes you get, you know, there's a lot of excitement with applying machine learning and digital transformation. And, and actually the existing digital technologies, which have been there for decades are not well maintained, but particularly yeah. the advanced control can be difficult to maintain. And that's creating a lot of value for you. So if you've only got it working 50% of the time, by far the quickest win you can get is by, you know, getting that working properly and maybe, you know, some technology can help you with that. Some machine learning can even help to identify when you've got bad uh, control. Um, but you need to build on that solid foundation. And I think second part of it is moving to the cloud. A lot of our clients have been reluctant. You know, they've got some security concerns, particularly in different parts of the world. That is changing and starting to change very quickly. Um, and I think it's important for people to embrace that because it just brings it. it facilitates the use of you know, elastic computing, almost unlimited computing resource, the ability to handle huge data sets, um, and all of that open source software, which is available to, for instance, you know, Python and so on for, yeah. for, for machine learning. So I think that it's important to start to free up the data, if you like, because sometimes getting access to that data when it's at the plant level is a, is a challenge. Oh, okay, interesting. Now, from, from, from your description there, uh, it seems that at the core of it, uh, uh, the application of AI 
uh, is about optimizing processes using data. Now, what are the benefits of, of such a data-driven process of optimization, particularly when compared with traditional methods? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a great question. But, you know, we've, we've discussed that with some of our clients because there are some well-proven uh, methods, for instance, for process optimization. And in general, um, for, for, in terms of real-time optimization, process optimization in refineries, petrochemical plants, then the, the, there's been two approaches. One is to extend the multivariable predictive control because that already has some optimization built in. You can add an objective function. You can add some uh, prices if you want to, to, to the variables, which are the independent and dependent variables, which are being managed or manipulated variables, control variables in multivariable control uh, terminology. Um, and that is actually kind of a data-driven approach because they're statistical models which are used within a multivariable controller. They're generally um, obtained by doing step tests on, on the unit. So you, you change some variables, you perturb some variables on the plant and you observe what happens and then you use some mathematics to uh, identify some fairly simple linear dynamic models. Um, so in some ways that is a kind of precursor to or a type of machine learning model. Um, and then the second approach is to use rigorous first principle models, so real time, which is um, what people would traditionally call a real time optimizer. And um, the advantage of that is they're nonlinear. So whereas the multivariable models are tend to be linear, so you can model all of the nonlinear nonlinear characteristics. The downside is they tend to be steady state models, whereas the multivariable control are, are, are dynamic models. And I, th I think the fundamental benefit of using a more data-driven approach is you can learn from the past. When you use a traditional rigorous model, real-time optimizer, mm -hmm. it doesn't know, it doesn't remember anything about what happened in the past. Um, and so it doesn't learn from experience. Basically it runs on a, you know, maybe a one hour cycle or every few hours and it will kind of fine tune itself to the current pl plant condition by doing some data reconciliation and parameter estimation to, to come up with a good match of the current operation. And then it'll run an optimizer to find a better operating point. But it doesn't know anything about all the years of previous operations. Whereas if you're using a data-driven approach, you can analyze all of that past history and you can work out, well, we, when we run the plant this way, when we had this feedstock in the past, we ran it this way and we got you know this result. Um, I think you can get, uh, a lot of insights which are not available. I would say though, in the approach that we've been exploring and I think has most potential is to combine the two, to combine the first principle modeling approach and, uh, mm -hmm. and the machine learning approach. So you try and get the benefits of both. You get the benefit of the rigorous model, which obeys the laws of thermodynamics and all of the historical data. Uh, so that, that's, um, I think has the, for me the most potential. Although, you know, machine learning purists would argue that you know, with reinforcement learning and so on, you can you can also uh, fight almost uh, reinvent the laws of thermodynamics and, yeah. and build them into the model if you've got enough data. But that requires you know huge amount of data and, and um, will take a lot of time and a lot of computing power. Uh, yeah, that makes a, makes a lot of sense actually. Now. Another interesting concept is the, is the application of uh, natural language processing uh, for managing uh, industrial data. Could you explain to us how that works? Yeah, well, well uh, let me start with, with an example of a use case that we work, we've been working on recently. So we, a lot of historically um, operators would write down their logs in handwritten on paper and they would write a shift handover report. So the outgoing operators would write down what the, anything that they thought was important uh, and put it in a, you know, a piece of paper, which they would hand to the next operator that's coming in and taking over from them. Um, of course, these days, often that's in digital form, but it's still typed, hand typed by, by the operators. Well, some of the information, you know, uh, any particular problems that they've had, any action that they took, any particular, um, uh, things that they think the, the incoming shift should pay attention to. Um, and so you get a lot of this natural language, um, docu these natural language documents. 
created over time because you can imagine you know in a particular plant you might have hundreds of operators you're changing shift every eight hours or so yeah. um so you're getting a lot of this information so no one really is useful for that particular moment you know when you're shift ch- ch- handing over uh, the shift or when you're sending us instructions for a particular shift but it's difficult to analyze it afterwards to get any useful insights from it because it's just too much of it and it's not in a easy machinable machine readable form because it's in natural language so one of the examples that we've been using is uh, to create a taxonomy and an ontology using semantic web technology in, in the form of a knowledge graph and we can build that using international standards so some of those standards are already available in in in, in a semantic form and then using also equipment lists which might be specific to the particular plant we can start to add entities extract entities from those reports and also even if the operators are writing things you know they sometimes will have typos or they'll refer to equipment with slightly different um, names but you can put those uh, within the knowledge graph to some extent Um, so then you can add you know a list of all of the equipment that's referred to in a particular report or a particular operating log you can put any hazards you know for instance like uh, electrical hazards or uh, you know, uh, vapor releases or high temperature vibration, whatever. Again, you can have a have those built into a knowledge graph, and you can add those as tags to all of the reports. And then you can, and that enables semantic search. So you can easily type. You know, anytime there's been an, um, a heat exchanger problem, you just type that in, in 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 a search bar, and it will give you all of the reports that refer to heat exchanger problems or a particular heat exchanger. You know, if you've got a HX 101, and it will find all the references to that heat exchanger, even if sometimes there's a dash in between HX and 101, um, or it's in uppercase, lowercase, whatever. And um, and then the other thing you can do is you can start to build um, lists, and you can create um, KPIs associated with those reports. You can say, well, which shifts have the are seeing the most problems? Which pieces of equipment have the which types of equipment, which particular items of equipment are referred to more, more frequently in these reports. And then you can, um, you can target you know, get those, th- that equipment with your maintenance teams and your engineering teams to, 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 uh, uh, to, to resolve any, any of those longstanding issues or uh, you know, troublesome alarms or control loops or whatever, when control loops in manual. So, this over time makes the plant much safer because you you're identifying what the pot- potential problems are before they become uh, you know major uh, hazards and, uh, and and can can significantly improve the safety of the plant. Shift handover is a particularly hazardous time uh, for 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 the, for the for the plant. So um, you know that's one example. I think in general, um, you know I, I'm a engineer so process engineer so i tend to focus more on the numbers than on the on the on the words and i think there's great you know great opportunity to apply machine learning as we just discussed in um to the process data but but when you come to um when we've been trying to build production management systems sometimes they're called integrated manufacturing operations management systems or manufacturing execution systems but these level three production systems between the enterprise level SAP type systems and the automation systems. One of the things people have always struggled with is, is how to how to model the data because they comprise many different applications. A lot of those uh, legacy applications have their own database, they have their own schemas within that database, um, and they refer to the same objects in different ways. And how to integrate all of those applications and integrate all of that data, which is in those different data silos, is a a huge challenge. So I think, again, this semantic web uh, approach, I believe, is one which shows a lot of potential for solving that problem. You know, what people have sometimes tried to do is create a big data warehouse, which is bring all the data from all those other databases into one big database with a huge data model. But in relational databases, it's extremely inflexible when you want to change the data model, which, of course, you need to do all the time. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think the semantic web approach is a, a bit more flexible 
And it's kind of very simple, but potentially very powerful for integrating all of those applications and supporting this natural language, you know, allowing you to, um, to process natural language and to think about all of the, the, the use cases associated with that, like providing people with the information that they need when they need it, being able to search for any particular information. So I was talking about uh, searching the operator logs, but if you want to search for a piece of equipment, you would like to find all the engineering data associated with that, you know, all the process flow diagrams, piping and instrumentation diagrams, all the equipment data sheets. You'd like to find all of the, the historical plant data, yeah. all the maintenance records. You know, doing that today is a very time consuming exercise, whereas, you know, in principle, you would like to be able to Google it, right? Just like you yeah. can with anything else on Google. And so I think with, the, with, with applying these semantic technologies, knowledge graphs, which is one of the things which powers Google search, um, I think you can start to, to enable that in a, in a plan and, and it really transform the productivity of, of the people um, operating and, and supporting those plants. Oh, okay, that's, that's quite interesting. Now, another area of the application of AI uh, technologies uh, uh, is in the, in the process simulation, right? So how effective is the application of machine learning in, in process simulation? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think I, I come from originally from a simulation background, and um, I would say one of the challenges we've had with simulation is, well, the major challenge is having time to do it. It takes a lot of time. So I think that where I see the greatest potential, one of the synergies between simulation and machine learning I mentioned earlier was to to improve the quality of the data going into the machine learning. The other synergy is to automate simulation, particularly when you're trying to calibrate the simulation model. So one of the things you obviously, when you build a model, first of all, when you build the model, you can not, not so much machine learning, but you can use again, these semantic technologies to automate the building of the model from the engineering data. So you've got 3D P and ID data now, you know, we can bring that in and aut automatically create the simulation model. Um, so that speeds up building the model in the first place. And then you need to tune the model. So you, in, in many cases, there's some calibration parameters or tuning parameters which you need to adjust. And some you need to do that from time to time, depending on the process. You might have to do it every few years to, to every few months. And again, I think machine learning can help. First of all, select the right data, good data. And, and then to um, automate that calibration process. And, and ultimately, what you really want is that simulation running online automatically, uh, you know, every hour, or every day, whatever the right frequency is, depending on the process. And, and then combining it with machine learning to optimize the plant, to identify anomalies, as I mentioned, you know, anomaly detection, to identify problems with equipment. And all of that shouldn't require any interaction of an engineer. The only thing the engineer should be getting is a signal from the system. Okay, there's a problem here. You need to go and troubleshoot this problem. We think it might be A, B, or C. You, you know, they might then need to do some manual simulation to try and investigate further what the problem is. But um, you know, we're quite far from that. And historically, it's taken a lot of process engineering time to build the models, calibrate the models, and to use the models. And therefore, they tend not to be used to anything like the extent that they, they could be. So the value you get from them is much less than it, than it could be. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Now, so one area that I'm uh, personally uh, researching on is the uh, it's application of the digital twin concept uh, in the in, in process analytics. Uh, can you explain to us uh, about the application of digital twins in, in continuous process industries? Yeah, well, actually, that's kind of what I was just touching on. Now, you know, digital twin means can mean many things, and it means many uh, different things to different people. Um, you know, some people talk about the digital twin over the asset life cycle. That was right. Uh, I partly referred to that when I was talking about using semantic technology, 3D P and IDs to automate the generation of the model. My particular area is online use of simulation 
during the operation of the plant. So not so much in the des design phase. So I haven't been involved in process design so much in the past. Um, and that, that's where, you know, I, I believe we can automate the running of that simulation and combine the simulation with machine learning. So the digital twin for me should be a combination of first principle simulation models and machine learning running continuously from plant data, which is collected automatically through your process historian and maybe some lab data coming from your lab systems and analyzer data and, and running that continuously. And that's at the plant level, but you can also con conceive of a digital twin for your whole value chain. Because one of the challenges in the process industries, particularly the petrochemical refining industry, is the supply chain is extremely complicated. Getting the feedstock into the plant, operating the plant in the optimum way, getting the right feedstock, first of all, selecting the right feedstock, then getting it to the plant, and then getting the products from the plant to the terminals and from the terminals to the gas stations and to the other customers, chemical customers and what have you. It's a highly complex mathematical optimization problem. So even just visualizing, knowing what's happening, where your inventory is, what you have, what material you have in what locations, when it's going to arrive by train or by ship or whatever, lorry, truck, um, you know, that's very complicated. But then to optimize all of that, uh, again, this is something that is, could, could make a significant impact on, on emissions because there are a lot of emissions associated with, uh, with, the, with this value chain both in the transportation of the material and obviously also the processing in the, in the, in the plant. So if you can Im improve that, a dollar a barrel across a typical uh, refinery supply chain, but which is a lot of money because they're yeah. processing, you know, hundreds of thousands of barrels a day. Um, so it's hundred, hundreds of thousands of dollars a day of money you can save, but perhaps more importantly, you can significantly reduce the CO2 emissions in, in, the, in the value chain. So that's another type of digital twin. Um, and, and there are many others, but you know, I, I think that the synergy between machine learning and simulation has got great potential in, to improve productivity, reduce emissions, safety and profitability. Yeah, awesome. I mean, you have already given us uh, a, a few uh, use cases, I mean, of, uh, of the application of AI in the process industries. Do you perhaps uh, have some common use cases that you think are really compelling that you could, uh, that are worth mentioning? Well, I think, I think the first one, that, the simplest one, uh, which is probably what, what I, I believe why it's been the most prevalent up till now is predictive maintenance. So taking, you know, they've been doing this for a while, um, taking vibration data. So they have these condition monitoring systems for large turbines and compressors. And this applies to any industry. They do it on aircraft as well for aircraft engines. Um, you know, GE were one of the leaders of this with them. They, they acquired a company called Smart Signal. Um, uh, and and um, so processing that data, um, vibration data and, and other process data, can give you advanced warning of failures of that of those large machines, you know, sometimes weeks or even months ahead of that you would otherwise know. And that gives you time to plan your maintenance, obviously also avoids having a, a, an unexpected breakdown of the equipment, which is a safety issue on a, on a process plant. So, you know, I think that's one of the compelling use cases and one of the more, more widely proven uh, use cases. We've had a lot of good success also with process data analytics where we analyze quality problems. So a good example in many of our Japanese customers, historically, they had a very um, well-defined supply chain. They got their feedstock from the same company all the time. In one of the historical earthquakes in Japan, that supply chain got disrupted so they had to start getting feedstock from other suppliers because the, the previous supplier was affected by the the earthquake and even though the feedstock that they bought was the same specification as the one they were using before what they found was they're having product quality issues because although it was within specification it was actually different from the one that they'd always been processing and we use data analytics to help identify what the problems were, whether it was a feedstock quality problem, and then what particular characteristics of the feedstock were, which qualities of the feedstock were, were causing the problems, and, and then how to, uh, to, to 
uh, adjust the process to, to account for that so that they could eliminate these uh, process quality problems. So we, we've run many projects like that to analyze um, the kind of root cause of product quality issues just by analyzing process data using very simple uh, machine learning techniques. So, you know, I think that's another compelling use case. And then I referred to the process optimization one where you start to add the uh, process simulation. That's more complicated, um, but it has potentially more, more power. Oh, okay, Krista. Now, you might have touched a, a bit on this, but what do you see as being the, 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 the biggest challenges when it comes to, to the application of AI in the process industry? I think, I think that the um, first thing is the scale, the scaling. You yeah. know, what, what you've seen in most process companies at the moment, process industries at the moment, they're trying AI. They've, they've done some pilot projects. They've done some proof of concepts. They've got some good results. But when they come to scale it, it just takes too much effort. And then, you know, once you've even, and this is just to implement it, then you have to maintain all of those models as well. So I think that's the biggest challenge. And you, you, you can see some companies which are trying to automate the machine learning uh, building process with machine learning platforms and auto ML. And, you know, that's certainly one approach. Um, but that I think is the biggest challenge is really scaling. And, you know, it, it does take quite a lot of um, brain power and, and manpower at the moment or woman power to, to uh, build these machine learning systems and machine learning models and then to, to maintain them. So I, I think that's the, the number one, challenge and then you know associated with that we need to change all the the, the the people right so everyone needs to get tooled up with how to build these machine learning models because it's going to impact everybody um and uh that you know changing the people takes takes longer actually than, yeah. than building the models and and um changing the the process uh so i think those are possibly the two biggest uh, challenges to to uh, really wide scale use of of machine learning in in the process industries. Oh, okay. And and what do you see as being the the, the future potential of, of of AI in process industries? Say maybe uh, five years from now. I mean, you never know really know how technology could change between now and maybe next three years. But what 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 sort of picture do you have of of, of how it's going to pan out there? So okay. I, 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 there's kind of two things come to my mind at the same time. You know, one is my experience of, of you know, symbolic AI expert systems try, and, and trying to apply that in small ways to the process industries um, 30 years ago. And, you know, not really, really didn't get much success. You know, there were some companies uh, um, that, uh, that, that made some money for a while, but, but eventually most of them went bankrupt. Um, and then counter to that, the huge progress that's been made in particularly machine learning and deep learning um, by the technology companies in the last 10 years. So, you know, you've got, and, and some of the things you've seen from DeepMind with uh, reinforcement learning, mm. um, you know, these are, are amazing achievements that have been made. but at the expense of huge amount of computing power um, and huge amount of data, which some companies have. So I think they're, so it's difficult to predict. Things don't move that quickly in the process industry. So five years in a process plant is not uh, five years in a, in a Google type yeah. company, a technology company. Um, but I do think that there is um, really really exciting potential from from the application of, of these technologies and and it's a bit like the cloud I mentioned earlier it's taken a long time for the cloud to really take off in in enterprise um, you know I think it happened much quicker in consumer industries you know with those technology companies like Google um, Amazon you know etc but um, to, to being to, to really being used uh, in the enterprise, it took a bit longer. But now you've got AWS and Google Cloud yeah, and, and yeah. Azure from Microsoft, and they're you know starting to to well, they're huge businesses now, really huge businesses. So I think that will uh, speed things up uh, a lot. And there's a there's a phrase, there's a quote I heard recently. Uh, I can't remember who said it, but he was talking yeah. about going bankrupt. 
I went, I, I went bankrupt slowly and then quickly and suddenly. So, you know, you kind of adopt these technologies very, it takes a long, long time. And then suddenly you get a step change in, in, the, in the implementation. So, um, uh, you know, I think that might happen. So maybe in the next five years, we'll see that sort of step change in, in uh, and, and that machine learning will become widespread. It's, it, on the edge of that five years, at the end of that five years, I think it is possible that that could happen. Now, but based on your maybe experience and your analysis, how long do you think it would take for AI to really have an impact, particularly in the process industries? Like, if you if you were to take like a wild guess, how long do you think? Well, I think I think I think the uh, the five years is a good um, a good time scale for having a significant impact. You know, really creating significant value. It's already starting to create some value, um, but to to really have a significant impact, I think the next five years will will be a good time frame to become widespread. So that it becomes like a mature technology, like multivariable control is, advanced control is, then you know that's probably more like ten years to, for that to happen. I mean, multivariable control took, you know, probably ten years to become, maybe more than that, maybe twenty years to become really widespread in the process industries. You know, some of the leading companies like Shell were, were implementing it. In, you know, in, within five years they'd implemented it quite widely, maybe ten years. But some of the other companies took 20 years before they they implemented it now things are getting quicker you know te te implementing technology is a lot easier now than it was because just the computers and so on were more difficult in those uh, early days of multivariable control um so you can imagine those time scales will be compressed but i would think to get significant value is still another five years and then to be widespread at least another 10 years from now so for five years again oh, okay awesome now one of the uh, uh, phrases that you you you, you refer to a lot in your, in your articles is the is the concept of the industrial automation to industrial autonomy. Essentially, what do you mean ab about that? Yeah. So ultimately, <clears throat> what industrial autonomy is is the equivalent of a, a self-driving car, right? So a Google car, or whatever the whatever the companies are now that well, maybe a Tesla yeah. is getting closest to it, but. Um, Self self driving car and uh, it's um you know when I I, I uh, if you told me that was going to happen ten years ago you know the cars would be able to drive themselves I, I would have laughed at you and yet two years ago I was in a self driving car in Russia you know you wouldn't even expect Russia would be at the <laughs> forefront of, a, of that technology right but they're even doing it in Russia so um, the the um, so, so what that what that means in a plant context is that ultimate autonomy means that there's there's not only no there's no it's not auto automatic there's no operator at all the operators don't intervene now you know at the operations level many plants are close to that already the operators shouldn't really be uh, interacting with the plant under normal operation where they tend to have to get more involved is in startup shutdown maybe decoking furnaces and other procedures that they have to carry out um, and even those should be and can be largely automated the ultimate the, the main problem in in, in most cases is uh, manual control valves so some of the older plants they don't have remotely operated valves you can't you have to go out and manually adjust the valves now new plants can be built with with those motor operated valves and so they can be in principle fully operate uh, fully automated then the next big challenge is emergency situations, right? So how do you get a, a computer to really be able to manage in those situations? That would, you know, is another level of autonomy, which will take much longer uh, to solve. But I think AI has the potential to significantly uh, address, that, uh, address that problem. And then finally, the last problem is maintenance. So, you know, it's, it's very, it's, it would be very nice if we didn't have to put any people in the field close to the equipment because it, it's hazardous. You know, when there's an explosion, if there's anyone there, then then of course they're at great risk. Um, so what people try to do is move operations further from those hazardous locations with remote operating centers and so on. But the problem is with maintenance, you still need to send people there at the moment. So people are using robots and drones for inspection, which is good. So you have less people. Um, and you'll see, we will see that happening more and more, but we're still some way away from a robot 
really been able to you know dismantle dismantle a piece of equipment and change a seal or clean the equipment or fix it a, a, a piece of equipment so you know that's 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 the ultimate goal for a completely autonomous plant is one that can even fix itself right without any <laughs> without any humans um but that's what we mean is is basically a plant which completely takes care of itself is autonomous it doesn't need any interference from from a from a human being and really the main driver is safety you know because we still have way too many people um serious accidents and obviously even deaths in 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 process in the process industries um and you know that of course is our first objective is to eliminate uh, that completely and the only way to completely eliminate it is to make sure that people are not in the hazardous uh location oh okay now uh how far along do you do, 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 uh, think the impact of uh, like the COVID pan pandemic has pushed this this uh, drive to autonomy? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I hear a lot of people claiming in the technology companies that COVID nineteen and working from home and what have you has has driven progress. I think in our industry it slowed it down because. Um, there is no doubt there are some productivity losses in, in a there are some things particularly because a lot of the systems are still at the plant level and cannot be easily remotely accessed that you have to do at the plant yeah. and so you know we haven't been able to travel certainly overseas uh for some time even in some cases you can't visit plants because they they're locked down or we're locked down because of you know they, they obviously don't want to risk um, an outbreak at the plant because then they've got no one to operate the plant. They have to shut down the plant. So uh, I think it's that's uh, had a, a negative impact, slowed things down in, in many ways. Um, and it has helped a little bit in terms of people being a bit more open to um, video conferencing, video meetings like this one, but <laughs> also remotely accessing the, the, the plant, uh, you know, using IT. But because uh, they've very hesitant often with that so i think people it has started to make people think a bit more about moving to the cloud and maybe freeing up access obviously in a secure way that's cyber security is, is always the very important um so it has helped from that point of view but actually practically i think projects have had to go a bit slower and, and some projects haven't proceeded because people have had to prioritize just keeping the plants working um, with 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 you know operators, uh, with 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 some people obviously having to be at home or being sick or whatever. The, the main thing is just keeping the plants running. Oh, okay, all right, that's interesting. Now, uh, in conclusion, um, for those who are not familiar with uh, Yokogawa, uh, could you tell us about the company, and and then more specifically, could you tell us about uh, more about uh, Yokogawa Digital Solutions? Yeah, so um, Yokogawa Electric Corporation is full title. It's a Japanese headquartered company. It's a multinational company. Um, started about 100 years ago. Um, it's about a $4 billion company focused almost entirely on industrial automation. Um, 90 plus percentage of our revenues come from industrial automation. Um, we work in, with many different industries, uh, but I'd say the majority the biggest part of our business is um, the oil, gas, petrochemical, and chemical uh, industries. And we started actually as an electric meter company. So um, the founder created a research institution to build um, elect electric meters at the time when electricity was just being start started to be introduced to, to, to Japan. Um, and then developed that into sensors, so measuring uh, devices which were applied to industry and then control systems. We were one of the, well, we were first company to introduce a distributed control system in Japan in the mid seventies uh, and then safety systems. And then we've started to, um, over the last few decades, we started to extend that to those end, um, production management systems that I was referring to the kind of level three systems, advanced control. And then we bought a company called KBC, which I used to work for in the past, which is a simulation and consulting company, particularly in refining petrochemical industry and, and, and upstream oil and gas. Um, and uh, so now we have quite a um, full 
portfolio of digital technologies, the traditional ones like advanced control, multi-verbal control, modular procedure automation for doing those automated startups, shutdowns, uh, great changes, et cetera, uh, information systems, um, process historians and, and uh, other um, operations management uh, systems, asset management systems and so on. Um, and we also have some of our own machine learning technology. And of course, we also use uh, open source uh, machine learning libraries. And we're starting to uh, have good success of applying that technology. And this year, we launched uh, Yokoga Cloud. Uh, so it's our cloud platform. As I said, our customers have been a little bit slow to adopt the, the cloud, although we did buy a, a, another company that's been um, providing plant, real-time plant data in the cloud from oil and gas, oil and gas platforms, from chemical companies. They've been doing that for, for 20 years. So, so some companies have been allowing, you know, just using VPN, remote um, yeah. uh, VPN access to a process uh, historian or process database and then allowing supply chain partners to access that that data in the cloud. But we've been doing that for, for 20 years. So yeah, we have a you know widespread portfolio of um, of IT uh, applications in addition to all of our automation and control system um, systems. Okay. All right, so that brings us to the end of this session. Uh, thank you so much, Simon, for coming on to the show and sharing your insight with us. Well, thank you, Kusai, for inviting me. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for the insightful questions. And um, yeah, I uh, appreciate very much the opportunity.